started? It's 2.35. All right. We have a small but mighty crew, which is going to be just great, because the truth is this presentation, this workshop is really more about the work that you guys are going to do, talking to each other and reflecting together. So welcome everybody in person, online, to the Teaching Do-Over Workshop, Learning from Mistakes, Goops, and Happy Accidents. My name is Tabitha Kidwell. I'm one of the core fellows, Fort Core, AU Core faculty fellows through CTRL for this year. Hi everyone, I'm Chuck Cox. I'm the other mm -hmm. AU Core CTRL faculty fellow and I teach in the Writing Studies program. So um, the objectives of today's session are to identify one source of challenge in, um, or sources of challenge in one aspect of your teaching. Hopefully make a plan to address that type of challenge in similar situations in the future and offer feedback and support to colleagues. Um, so we're gonna start by Chuck and I sort of modeling what we expect you all to do by sharing about our own do-overs, some mistakes or goofs or happy accidents that we've encountered and how um, we learn from them and what we do differently in the future. We'll briefly discuss some potential sources of challenge and the value of reflection to help overcome those challenges. And then the bulk of the session will be time for participants to work together, share your experiences and um, discuss how you can learn from them and give each other some feedback. And then we'll finish up by sharing some helpful strategies and suggestions. Um, so first, my do-over um, was a class discussion on language use in Ukraine that I did in class about a year ago. This was in uh, a U core diversity course that I developed called Language Education and Equity. Um, and so the course is focused on linguistic diversity and linguistic discrimination. And as news stories were coming up out about language use in Ukraine and the way that many people were shifting from Russian to Ukrainian, even in traditionally Russian speaking parts of the country, um, I thought it was something that was really timely and related to the class and something that would be of practical interest to the students. So I planned some activities focusing on that situation. I assigned students um, one reading, this reading by Maria Reva that was in the Globe and Mail, an op-ed piece. And um, I strongly encourage them to do a 40 minute podcast on the Rough Translation podcast through NPR. I also include one, included one um, optional reading by Michael Idov that was in, maybe in the New York Times. Oh no, it was in the, um, it was in Vanity Fair. Um, the readings were short. The podcast was about 40 minutes and I thought pretty accessible. Um, in class, the activities were for students to brainstorm the main points of the podcast and kind of generate what had stuck with them from the podcast as a class. And then I provided four quotes from the articles who the authors of those two articles were also featured in the podcast. Um, but I basically asked students to choose the quote that appealed to them most, that was most interesting to them. And then they discussed that quote with other people who had also chosen that quote. And then I had groups share out as a full class. So that's what I planned. That's what I know was planned. And that's, that is what we did. Um, but what I remember about the class session is that students were much quieter than in other class sessions. They seemed quite reticent. Um, there was little eye contact or there was little participation during the presentation. There was a lot of, a lot of this going on. Um, the discussions in small groups, whereas in a lot of cases were pretty boisterous over the course of the semester, they were pretty quiet this day. Um, and there was pretty minimal participation during sharing out. So my perception at the time was that I felt that students were probably a little bit uncomfortable discussing such an upsetting current event, and that I probably could have prepped them for it more. Um, but when I prepared this presentation and actually went back to look at my plans and actually went back to look at my notes and actually reflected on it with a little bit of distance, I realized there were so many different ways that it went wrong that could have been addressed more effectively from the beginning. Um, so first off, I think it's likely that students did not listen to the podcast. And so when I asked them to generate ideas from the podcast, I can understand why they would not make eye contact with me. Um, because I had said like, if you only have time, do this one reading and then try to do the podcast. I think they probably took that as license to, okay, I'll do the one reading and maybe someone will do the podcast, but it's not gonna be me. 
Um, so if I had wanted them to listen to the podcast, I should have emphasized it as such. I should have said, you have to listen to the podcast to be prepared for class activities. Um, that being said, it was also week 12 of the semester. This is also week 12 of the semester. So you feel what it's like. Students are busy, professors are busy. We're all burned out. We can't wait till finals. We, well, we can't wait till vacation, right? We can't wait till summer. So knowing that I probably would have been better off playing some of the selections from the podcast for the class or doing something that drew on these rich resources, but acknowledge that students might not have time to access them as much as I had hoped. So that's one issue. I think it's likely students didn't do the reading or the pre-engagement. Um, and then the second issue, I think students might've been uncomfortable with the topic. I don't know, maybe, maybe not, but I definitely was uncomfortable with the topic. And I think I actually sort of undermined my own planning um, through my own sort of nervousness about addressing not necessarily a controversial topic, but a difficult topic, a really emotional topic, especially last spring. Um, you remember we were getting all kinds of terrible images coming out of Ukraine and it was a very sensitive topic, at least for me and I think for students too. So I, I think I should have taken some time to reflect on why discussing the topic of language in Ukraine made me uncomfortable, maybe share that with the students. So we had sort of my discomfort as a model for working through your own discomfort. Um, and then I actually didn't, this wasn't even a full class session. Looking back, I was like, oh, that was a tough class session. But this, these activities about language use in Ukraine were actually sandwiched between a discussion, sort of debriefing, some presentations we had finished up in recent weeks. And then at the end, a review of what we had covered before the presentations. So I hadn't even devoted a full class period to the, to the topic. So I think that planning sent the message that this content was an add-on, which it was. It wasn't originally in the syllabus, but it was very relevant. Um, and it basically sent the message it was not an important topic. So I think what I could have done is plan a more carefully considered session that helps students enter the topic and make connections to their own experiences, make connections to this course and other courses. I think I could have planned that all more effectively. So all that, <coughs> all that leads to sort of the third piece of why I think this didn't go well, which is in general, I think these activities could have been better designed. Um, I think that brainstorming in, as a full class was too high stakes. I could have given them time to discuss together and then share out um, the expectations for the quote activity. Looking back, I was like, what are they supposed to discuss about these quotes? I hadn't given them any discussion questions or any kind of clear guidance about what to discuss. Um, so on the whole, I think I could have given, um, sort of considered the course learning outcomes a little more carefully and looked at how this topic related to those outcomes and then plan activities that help students sort of bring those pieces together. So that's my do-over and my reflection on it. So mine bears some interesting similarities, but also very big differences to Tabitha's. Um, whereas hers was about something that you, you admitted being sort of uncomfortable about. Mine was the opposite. I was gung-ho about mine. Um, I teach a complex problem seminar themed around fantastical fiction. And during the summer, I came upon a just published book um, that we had in the AU library called The Dark Fantastic, Race and the Imagination from Harry Potter to the Hunger Games by Ebony Elizabeth Thomas. And this was such a great book. I was looking for something that could address issues of race in a really robust way because it hadn't been there before. And, but it's a very scholarly book. I knew I'm not gonna assign this book, but I could, the, the introductory chapter did everything you want a good book introduction to do. Laid out her, her theoretical approach, her main ideas, why she thought it was important. I thought, okay, we can read that. They're gonna love this. It's gonna lead to these really great conversations. It's gonna come not quite at week 12, but close to it. So it'll energize things again. No, they were so resistant, not because of the content. They said it was too hard. Now we'd read some scholarly and other challenging things before, but this apparently seemed to be on a whole new level. Maybe they were intimidated by the fact that it was a book, but a number of them said they started it and gave up because they were so intimidated. Some of them said they read it, but couldn't tell you anything about what it was saying. A few of them kind of got a few points um, and some of them just never bothered. 
And I was really upset because I thought that this was gonna be a great discussion. I wound up having to, first I had to spend time kind of talking them down from their complaining fest about how this is a terrible rewritten thing and it's so hard and what's the point of this that they really, a class that had been really smart and sharp and thoughtful had suddenly regressed to a lot of very knee jerk, almost juvenile kinds of reactions which they'd gotten past. And then I had to like basically spend the rest of the class explaining the whole thing to them, walking them through it. And we had no time for any meaningful conversation. It just became this like lead balloon in the middle of the class. So I was thinking about it afterwards and obviously the path of least resistance would be, okay, that comes out of the syllabus. Let me find something more accessible for them. But then I thought, no, no, no. Why did I want them to read this? Like I was excited by it and I knew the content was good and I knew it would spark some good conversations and connect to other things, but I had to get them over that hurdle. So part of it was the same, the same idea of I needed to prepare them for it more. But even that I thought just saying, okay, this is gonna be a tough reading, wasn't gonna be enough. That might actually scare some of them off. And so then I turned to, to two of those like happy accidents, right? When two things from two different places walk up to each other and shake hands. I was looking at the learning outcomes again for CP, a big part of which is critical reading. And I had been recently revisiting some work that I'd encountered in my field of composition and rhetoric by um, Mariolina Salvatore and Patricia Donahue, who specialize in reading. And I had a conversation had, had nothing to do with my class. We were talking about their work and how they are very much about the importance of leaning into difficulty. And that most people, let alone students, when they're confronted with something challenging, they're, they're, they want to shy away from it, they want to shut down, they want to you know, ignore it, when we all know that those moments that are challenging you are the ones you want to dig into the most, because that's where you're going to get the most out of it, both in terms of the ideas and the mental exercise. So I thought, okay, next time I do this, that's what we're going to do. So my, my class does a reading log where they do reading responses for most readings, and I usually give them a few prompts, I tell them they can go their own way, pretty open, but this time I said, nope, you're all gonna do one prompt. So Salvatore and Donahue say that the first thing you have to do when you're confronting challenge is name it. Why is this challenging to me? So that's what I had them do. I said, that as you read the chapter, pay attention for the passages, which we defined as a couple of sentences to a couple of paragraphs that really give you trouble. My little sneaky side door here was, in order to do that, you actually have to try reading it. Like you can't all pick the first two sentences, right? So, so right away I'm saying, mm, there's gonna be some accountability here. I want you to try. But I said, you have to choose a passage. Oh, sorry, I, I copied over my most recent version of this, which I adapted, it's one reading. Um, but anything goes line to a paragraph and after identifying it, explain what makes it challenging. Don't try to unpack it. Don't try to understand it. Don't try to work through it, just name it. This paragraph gave me trouble because she was using terminology. I had no idea what she was talking about or I didn't understand how this passage fit into the whole argument. So I made them write that up. When we came to class, I put them into pairs and said, okay, two things, share your difficult passages and then help each other figure them out. And so they took, I gave them 15 minutes, I think it may have stretched to 20, where they had to actually just, these two people, two passages, just dig into them. Do, you have access to anything at all. You can Google stuff, you can, you know, access course readings, whatever, just the two of you and the text. And then we talked about that, not the reading itself, but what was that like? How did you untangle it? What were the challenges? How did you face them? Which had the nice effect of giving us a, a takeaway list of strategies for tough readings that I was then able to reference later in the semester. Um, and then we were able to talk about the reading. And yeah, there were still some moments they didn't quite get and we had to work through them together, but we got them over that hurdle of, this is hard, I can't, I can't engage with it. I can't even get to the ideas. And so by rethinking what I was doing, getting past my own excitement over this reading and thinking, because I love it, they'll love it. And realizing, no, 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 we're not just about the content, we're also about the skills. We're also about teaching them how to do this. Um, I was able to, to reframe it and still use it and still use it productively and give them something that I think they appreciated. Even if they ended up not 100% getting it or 100%, really engaging with the ideas the way I wanted to, they did a heck of a lot better. And so every semester I try to incorporate this idea into um, a lot of other areas of, of, you know, like name your difficulty and then you know, be strategic about it. And so one of the things you need to do sometimes is tamp down on your own enthusiasm and look at things from a student perspective. 
And that's something I think a lot of us forget when we're, when we're planning. We get caught up in the excitement and we forget to, to think about the practicalities from a, a first year student, especially, or an undergraduate perspective. So that's my do-over, which was very hard to find because I usually don't make mistakes. <laughs> so I wanna turn it back over to Tabitha who wants to talk about some of the, we've heard a few things from our stories, but some more general ideas about reasons why things might not work. A, a totally inclusive list. No, this is just a few things that we were able to brainstorm. Of course, there are many, many reasons that things do not go as hoped or planned or intended. Um, some major potential sources of instructional challenge are that the instructor didn't create a safe environment. So because of that, students aren't comfortable taking risks, sharing with each other, engaging deeply, um, and they might become uncomfortable or emotional. And um, that kind of effective discomfort shuts down learning, certainly, very quickly, as well as meaningful exchange. Um, another potential source of instructional challenge is just, is the content too easy? Is it too difficult? Is it not relevant? Sometimes there's just a mismatch between the content and the course or the students or the activities. Something doesn't fit there. Very often, the professor's expectations are unclear or are unrealistic. So we might have some idea of what we want students to do, but we don't clearly convey that idea to students. So they don't have any idea or they have a, some kind of different idea that doesn't match ours. And so we end up disappointed by that. Or we have expectations that are not anything that we have given students the preparation, the support, the resources, possibly the time, and students aren't able to adhere to the expectations that we've set because they're unrealistic. And then lastly, it's possible that the connections to the course or to the content or to students or the rationale for using certain materials or activities or content, it's just not clear. So students don't see how the activity or the reading or the assignment connects to learning, connects to their lives, connects to the content. And so they would be less engaged. Of course, there are many others, and I think we'll hear more when we discuss together. Um, and then the last thing before we, we move into the workshop portion, um, I recently was uh, um, introduced to this article recently published by the AACNU, and uh, we can send the link on to folks who are interested by Patrick Colbert <laughs> called Better Teaching. You can write on it. And it's a really great article, uh, both thought-provoking and practical, about how writing is a form of teaching reflection. That is not, ref not teaching of reflection, but reflection on teaching. That as teachers, we often ask students to write to reflect, but we seldom do that ourselves. And that the act of writing out difficulties or things we want to work on is very valuable. And I'm just gonna hit on one or two things that he mentions. It's a really um, interesting article. But the two that really stuck out to me were doing an end of course reflection, especially if you're teaching a course for the first time or one that doesn't go the way you wanted it to, do a reflection on it. And he introduces what he calls the stop, keep, start framework, where you really ask yourself after looking at how things went, what should I stop doing? Because it didn't work, it's not relevant to the learning outcomes, it didn't quite fit. What should I keep doing that worked well? And what should I start doing that I hadn't done before, but now I realize I should start doing? Anything from policies I need to implement to replacements of readings or what have you, topics we didn't cover. And then also as part of that, getting feedback and advice from others and incorporating that into the reflection that actually not just hearing from students or colleagues, but connecting that to the reflection itself. Oh, okay, Cindy told me something that happened in her class and that makes me realize I can do something different in mine. And then the other uh, that he tells us is a really useful thing for a bigger picture approach is to actually write a teaching philosophy statement, which many of us, I know I haven't done that since I was first applying for jobs fresh out of grad school. And even then it was, it was not a terribly extensive thing. I've just kind of gone with the flow all these years and adapted to the changing field, but actually sitting down and forcing yourself to write out, what do I believe in as a teacher? What do I value? What do I want students? And in the article, Colbert has a really nice list of thought provoking questions uh, to approach that, which I, I didn't want to reproduce here. And then the last thing I want to add is, as I was reading this article, it was one of those head nod articles. That, yes, 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 this is a great, great way of thinking it. And I realized I actually sort of do a version of this already, and I wanted to pass this on. I have a document that I call Lessons from the Past, 
which is a Word document that lives in my current teaching files on OneDrive. And it's, I think it's on its fifth generation now. I've been doing it for years. And every once in a while, I have to start a new file. But what I do is I basically keep lists of all the stuff I want to remember that happens in the middle of the semester. So you can be sure the day that that Thomas reading happened, I typed in it. Oh my God, Thomas was too hard. You got to figure out something to do. So it's always things like that. Readings that worked, readings that didn't work. Parts of assignments that students were confused about. Activities that bombed, activities that were brilliant. Things I read about in my travels, things I hear colleagues talk about, because you know what? If I don't write it down, I'm gonna forget it. And so what I do is I have this list and, and it's broken down into general and then a list for each course I'm teaching. And then when the time comes to plan for the next semester, one of the first things I do is I open this document and I look through everything I wrote down last semester and last fall or whenever I'm looking at it. And I, oh yes, I gotta remember to scratch that assignment and rethink it. Or I have to remember that I still need a reading to cover that area because the previous one didn't work. Or I wanna try that thing that I heard about at a, at a conference. Um, and so I would, it, it sounds like such a basic thing, but taking the moment to, if it's in the classroom, write it down. If you're in the office, type it or your own preferred method of recording things. But it's a great way, I call it lessons from the past because I'm learning from both the mistakes I made during the semester and the things I learned that went really well. Uh, and it helps inform the next semester's teaching when I, when I have to, to plan. So I strongly recommend this article. And like I said, um, we can send that link in a follow-up email to you. Uh, it's a quick, interesting read. Well, actually, it's really easy to just Google. Oh yeah, that too. The title, Googling the title will get you the article. So. I'm gonna say time. There's always, there's always Google. All right, so um, we have reached the workshop portion of the workshop. So I'm trying to think um, about sort of the logistics of it. Um, so it looks like online we have four participants. So Brad, I think you're probably just going to need one breakout room there. And for us in the room, um, folks from CTRL and from CORE, do you guys did you bring a do-over, or are you here just kind of to support? <laughs> you have a do-over, Sarah. You have a do-over. Excellent. Mar Martin's got a do-over. Okay, then I think in the room, let's divide into two groups, and then so we'll um, take up until just about three forty, three forty-five for this. So we will give a, a good chunk of time. Um, so kind of the format we're going to follow, I think, with kind of more flexible or groupings and just fewer people who are overall, we don't need to adhere too closely to the 15 minutes. We can kind of just go as we need. Um, I was picturing, you know, lots of different groups doing lots of different pacing, but I think we can um, organize ourselves without concerning ourselves too much about the exact timing. But basically the protocol will be this. First, explain your do-over opportunity. Um, you don't have to answer all of these questions, but they, those questions might help you think through the idea. Um, so what went wrong? What do you think it went wrong? What changes have you considered? And then some time for feedback from the group, drawing on your own experiences. Um, if you've ever encountered a similar situation, how did you approach it? How would you approach it? What changes would you suggest? What resources or strategies could you suggest? And then um, three times, and then time at the end for the original discussant to make a plan for next time, talk about what they will do differently next time. So that'll be basically the format each of us will follow as we're sharing our do over. Um, so I'm gonna encourage everybody online, you can go into your group and I think Brad is sharing the protocol for you all. Um, we will come back together at the end to kind of share out some helpful strategies that are not specific to each of our do-overs, but that are helpful overall and would be helpful to other people with other situations. So we'll see you again at the end online, folks. Um, for those in person, I think we'll break into two groups um, and figure out with 45 minutes about how much time you'll have, um, probably about 10 to 15 minutes per person. Um, we'll want to get situated comfortably because we are going to be working for about 45 minutes. So. We can move somewhere that is comfortable for us. We can get some snacks. Sorry, online people, no snacks for you. <laughs> and let, well, you probably have snacks at home. Um, and I encourage you to try and put yourself in a group with someone that you don't work with often. 
the hope is that if you work with someone often, maybe you'll leave this workshop and continue to share strategies together. But this is a chance to engage with people that you don't work with so often. Um, and we're not gonna worry about the timer. We'll just kind of keep track of time overall. Um, yeah, any questions before we get started? All right, then let's go ahead and break into two groups.